Hi, my name is Reiko. I'm one of the technical specialists on the Azure Global Black Belt team. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS, specifically around private clusters. So what exactly is AKS private clusters? Um, in order to describe it a little further, we're gonna talk about for just a second, uh, regular AKS and how that gets deployed. Uh, and so a, a typical Kubernetes deployment involves uh, worker nodes and the master control plane or the actual Kubernetes API. So that's the actual service where you're gonna be uh, sending a kubectl commands or your sort of operational commands to that control plane, which will then will operate against the worker nodes, deploy your pods, your services, et cetera. So that master control plane, when you deploy under uh, normal circumstances with AKS, uh, is a publicly accessible endpoint. So you can send commands to it uh, from home, from your office, presuming you don't have any firewall rules uh, in your organization. But you can, you know, in your command line, kubectl get pods and hit that uh, domain name, uh, assuming you got your credentials as well, and perfectly fine. You can operate against your cluster. Uh, and, and so in that sense, the private cluster mode takes that master control plane and puts it uh, into your VNet or makes it uh, addressable in your VNet only. So it no longer becomes an internet addressable uh, endpoint. It's an uh, intranet or Azure VNet, or if you're peered with Azure itself from on-prem, it's accessible through private networking, essentially. Uh, and the benefit for this, if you're a highly regulated company or, or if you're a financial services, as an example, company, uh, or if you're a security conscious company where you don't really like the publicly exposed model, it might uh, introduce an additional attack vector against your organization, that sort of thing, then the private cluster mode is a, a great direction to go in. Now, the next question is, how does private clusters actually work behind the scenes? So uh, when you deploy AKS private clusters, first of all, you cannot upgrade an existing cluster to private clusters. You have to redeploy as it is today. Uh, second of all, uh, when you actually do deploy uh, private clusters, what happens is that we generate uh, two additional things for you on your behalf. Uh, one, uh, you get a private link set up, which is essentially a network card that will uh, act as the attachment for your actual control plane into your network. Uh, so we still manage uh, you know, multi-tenant um, master Kubernetes API control planes for uh, all of our customers. Uh, and you're, you have your own particular carved out piece. And that uh, master control plane that's carved out just for you uh, gets essentially a, a network tunnel or a private link in our, in our terminology to your subnet via that network card that we deploy for you. And so any communications to that FQDN, instead of going out through the public internet and then back uh, into Azure, it goes straight through that private link via the network card. Now. The second thing that we deploy on your behalf is a private DNS zone, which will then map the DNS name for your actual API, uh, your master API cluster itself, the, the Kubernetes master control plane, uh, to the IP address associated to that uh, private endpoint or that network card. So the next question is, why do you want to move to AKS private clusters? Uh, and the short answer is, uh, you don't have to. Uh, unless, of course, you're uh, very security conscious, meaning you don't want your API endpoint publicly addressable over the internet, uh, or if you're in a he heavily regulated or a compliance-driven organization. So uh, if you're in financial services, for example, private clusters is probably going to be your baseline. That'll be your first touch point in terms of deploying the service itself. Again, you wanna reduce the attack surface. You wanna also make sure that that API is just not available online. Uh, what you also gain as a result of it is defense in depth, meaning uh, because it's in your private network, because it's not publicly addressable, uh, you have, first of all have to compromise the network, meaning you have to be able to deploy a rogue service and be able to route to it. Uh, but that's not to say that immediately once something is deployed in there that it uh, has access right away. It's still, uh, you need credentialing, you need to have the right Kubernetes config in order to make calls to it, and it has to be the right uh, essentially compromised uh, login or individual uh, that has permissions to do anything malicious against the cluster anyways. Uh, and this is why role-based access control should be part of your security strategy when deploying, regardless of the network deployment. So that being said, again, if a rogue uh, your service VM gets deployed into your network somehow, uh, you should also be regulating the communication to the a API endpoint to just a handful of subnets, or if you need to really do it, uh, down to a certain set of IP addresses. Now, 
I wouldn't suggest the static IP route, meaning the very specific IP method, mostly because services spin up and down constantly, and so it's very hard to track uh, in this cloud native world where that service lives. Uh, it's essentially never guaranteed the same IP address, let's put it that way. Another perspective is why you don't need private uh, AKS clusters. And the short answer is, uh, in, if you do need to make calls against your cluster uh, via the public internet, via a separate service that's not inside Azure, there's no way to proxy that communication or doing so adds uh, additional operational overhead or is just too difficult to do so. Uh, the example being CI CD tools, perhaps you're hosting your uh, deployment tools in a SaaS service that lives outside of Azure that needs to call that public FQDN over the internet. Now, in, in those scenarios, this probably isn't gonna fit your organization's style, so to speak, uh, very well because, again, it's behind your network. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, the only way to deploy in this model with CICD tools is if you can actually deploy those worker nodes that runs your uh, build task, your automation pipeline, inside a VM or containers within Azure, within a subnet uh, or VNet that's been pure, uh, peered to that uh, endpoint. Um, so as long as that communication can flow uh, to it inside the VNet, you're, you're, you're good to go. Um, additionally, I mean, uh, it is some additional setup you have to configure. Uh, if you have uh, policies or you know, permissions or you know, management requirements where you cannot deploy private uh, endpoints, or sorry, uh, private DNS zones or network cards uh, as part of a you know, regulated process, then because those get deployed for you automatically and you have no control over it in, in, in that sense, that also might be a limiter for you in terms of deploying a private cluster. Uh, they're not insurmountable. You just have to reconfigure, or take another look at your policies to figure out uh, how do we actually enable this to be deployed on behalf, etc. cetera. Uh, but those are typically the concerns we see. Uh, and again, related to it not or it no longer being a publicly accessible uh, FQDN domain name endpoint. Now, the last thing to take in consideration is what isn't the AKS private cluster. So. Again, it is only moving your Kubernetes API endpoint off of the public internet and moving it behind your virtual network, essentially, making it only writable within your VNet uh, via private link. Now, that being said, it doesn't, as a result, block communication to your cluster. That's still uh, things around ingress rules and egress rules for outbound traffic from your cluster, as well as setting up firewalls if you need to do uh, packet inspection, that sort of thing, or just you know having a WAF set up in front of the cluster. Uh, that's completely separate. That's for your application workload, mind you. Uh, so it doesn't help to solve that. It's only one piece of this overall security model that you need to take a look at when deploying uh, a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so the next set of videos that we have in place will be to discuss what ingress and egress traffic should look like uh, from a security standpoint how you should secure uh, communication coming into the cluster to your actual applications, as well as how do you restrict the endpoints, or again, the FQDNs, domains, IP addresses, that your services can actually go out and speak to, either inside your private network or external over the public internet. Uh, so again, AKS Private Clusters does not solve for those pieces. Those are a, uh, a very important concern, but not part of this story where AKS Private Clusters comes into play. This wraps up our AKS private cluster video. Uh, we've taken a high level look at what it is, what it isn't, how it works, why you would choose it, why you wouldn't choose it, and what it isn't designed to do for you on your behalf. Uh, in a future set of videos, we're going to actually deploy this uh, a version of this cluster uh, and see how we can or cannot access that API endpoint uh, from my my local development environment from home, and then how we have to set up a jump box in order to uh, issue the Kubernetes API commands. So I, I hope you found value in uh, this video and in the series and you continue to watch. Uh, please let me know if you have any uh, future requests for videos uh, and feel free also to reach out to your uh, Microsoft rep or a local global black belt uh, working in cloud native computing and open source in your region. Uh, thank you for watching.